Hello class and welcome to This Week in Creativity. This week we're going to explore a little bit of creativity and personality. So here's an interesting fact. Creative people have a preference for concepts and meanings and tend to be big picture people rather than small detail people that are focused on facts and figures. Now, although, having said that, creatives do certainly get into the details when it comes to the elaboration phase of the creative pursuits, uh, creative people also tend to use broader categories. For example, in, in picture sorting tasks, a picture is sorted, uh, sort of task is uh, when you categorize pictures into categories and you sort them into like animals, so you have dogs and horses. Normal people would categorize them as animals, but creative people would simply sort them as four-legged creature categories or um, things like animals with fur categories. So they tend to categorize in very broad categories rather than into detailed categories. Creative people also tend to not pigeonhole items into a particular category uh, or a particular place and to leave it there. Things, categories tend to be fluid for creative people. When they categorize things, for example, when they consider alternate uses of an item, you can categorize a cup as a holder or as a vessel, but you can also categorize it as something made of plastic or something that is cylinder, uh, depending upon the needs of the context or the creative problems that you're facing. So there are many different ways that you can look at the same item and categorize it differently based upon the particular needs by creating these broad mental categories. And this allows people to see analogies and patterns and connections of things that wouldn't necessarily be seen by people that were categorizing them more narrowly. Highly creative people are also categorized by high levels of drive and ambition. Both artists and scientists have demonstrated intense um, oh, uh, drives. Uh, both in empirical and in case studies. Sometimes scientists more than artists, but they also score high in the need for achievement. Uh, certainly higher than the average person does. Uh, now let's look at um, things like loneliness, hostility, and aggression as well. Now, it's interesting that both artists and high-achieving scientists score lower on categories of warmth, for example, and in agreeableness scores than normal people do. They also score higher on the score known as psychoticism than the average person does. Now, this is this category of personality that was created by Hans Eisnick and who created uh, personality dimensions and some of his factors were things like the uh, dimension of extroversion introversion as well as neuroticism and psychoticism now psychoticism in general is breaking with reality and to see or hear or experience things that aren't there but in this scale where there what we see is that it's measuring the loosening of associations and then finally you have that psychotic break, which is why it's called the psychotic category, uh, psychoticism. Well, knowing what we know about creatives, of course, they are going to have a higher score on this particular psychoticism scale since it measures the looseness of associations, which we know is a major part of what makes creatives actually creative is that flexibility in categories and trying to find associations where other people don't see them and so that of course naturally is going to be something that we will see when we measure 
um, personality of highly creative people. Now, if we were to look at uh, uh, highly creative Harvard students, for example, uh, more modern studies with Harvard students has shown that high achieving Harvard students have scored higher on the psychoticism scale and lower on the agreeableness scale as well. And now, so this kind of reflects the same kind of research that was done on other high, highly achieving people. Now, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about introversion and extroversion. Uh, there are several different ways of looking at introversion and extroversion, but I want to kind of narrow in on the original way, uh, the psychoanalytic point of view, where extroversion is energy that... Um, And there's an intentional flow that is flowing out from the person towards the environment. People who are extroverted um, would be energized by the external world, by engaging with the external world. And so the psychoanalytic perspective would, would picture the typical extrovert as someone that is energized and drives their energy from interacting with the outer world, whereas introverts, the energy is flowing into their minds from the environment. And so it's very interesting that, that uh, introvert is energized by engaging the internal world, the, their internal world of ideas and fantasies. And that world that they live in is a very rich and powerful world. And so that is where they find their reward. So in these psychoanalytic conceptualizations of extroversion and introversion, you need to kind of remember that it has nothing to do with being shy. It is really where does the energy come from? Does it come from the external world or does it, does it come from your internal world? If you're able to engage with your internal world and you're an extrovert, then you will feel energized. If you have to engage with the external world and you're an introvert, then you're going to feel drained. And vice versa for the extrovert. An extrovert's going to love to be at parties. They're not going to want to be stuck in a room by themselves with their own thoughts. And that is what Carl Jung meant when he used the terms introversion and extroversion. So when we look at creative people according to these measurements, they tend to be introverts because they are very interested in the internal world of their own thoughts and minds. And they live and experience in a very rich inner world that they like to spend time in. And a lot of time in that in inner world doesn't mean that they're shy or that they're not sociable. It just means that they have a rich inner world and that rich inner world is energizing them in some way. Now, because of this propensity towards introversion, the typical creative person requires a time of solitude uh, from time to time to reflect and to process, whereas extroverts have a tendency not to need much time alone at all. They prefer to be with other people. So, scientists tend to be highly conscientious, and they also tend to be very high in dominance or the need to control. And you don't necessarily see that in, for example, creative artists. And so there is a little bit of variability in the types of creatives that you have. Scientists tend to be highly conscientious and also highly dominant, whereas creatives tend to be low conscientious and not quite so interested in dominance. Creative scientists also tend to have low socialization characteristics, but unlike creatives that are um, uh, creative artists that are overly unconventional, because unconventional can be controversial, a scientist, a high achieving creative scientist, will tend to hide their unconventionality. They might be quirky, they might have um, very unique interests, but they're going to tend to hide those, whereas a very creative artist is rewarded for putting on display their unconventionality. So like, for example, we do not want our 
jet engine designer to be overly weird. Uh, they, that will typically not lead to success. Whereas if you were a clothing designer, that would be expected of you. So, the in, in this case, the creative scientist will tend to hide their unconventionality. So, creative scientists tend to be asocial as well. Uh, they tend to not care about interacting with others. So if you go to a, a business conference, for example, you'll see a lot of partying going on. Uh, people will tend to get a little bit wild and crazy and have a lot of fun socially. But if you are at a conference for extremely high-achieving creative scientists, uh, that kind of social activity is not as prevalent because... Uh, highly creative scientific thinkers tend to not be as motivated by the social engagement. So here are some characteristics that typically are found in the personality traits of eminent creative people. Uh, they tend to be bright, creative, complex, and deep. And you can see how this kind of overlays in the type of uh, research that we see with creatives. Now, other research has looked at personality traits of artists. And the number one personality trait that came up for artists was being open, then being unconventional. That they have a preference for complexity, for novelty, for, for novelty seeking, for knowledge seeking, for being independent, and for having strong ego strength and being assertive and being self-assured, being able to be highly involved in their work, to be able to persevere in their work. as opposed to giving up on a project. And also a strong preference within artists for the big picture perspective. And finally, artists typically need a time of solitude. Now, if we're to compare that the creative artist with the creative scientist, what we tend to find is that the creative artist tends to be less conscientious and a little more moody than the creative scientist, who tends to be more conscientious and a little more self-controlled with their mood. But, and here's the diff another difference between the creative scientist and the creative artist, is that the creative scientist has to have a, uh, tends to have a stronger preference towards dominance. So, if we were to sum it all up, we could really uh, put the relationship between creative person and personality. Uh, um, one of the main things is being openness, which includes intellectual openness. It means a preference towards complexity, towards uh, openness to knowledge, towards seeking new and novel ways of doing things, towards... Uh, unconventionality, as well as the ability to absorb the self within the work. And the second overarching group that you can see within creatives is what we could call ego strength. And under the ego strength category, we could include things like assertiveness, being self-assured, and the ability to persevere. And then finally, we could say that there's a third category of aspects, personality aspects in creatives, and that is low sociability, uh, which would include perhaps things like a tendency towards introversion and the need for solitude, a need for aloofness, and at times aggressiveness and arrogance. Now, although we have a lot of reliable information 
about this association between creativity and personality, it's still difficult to say whether or not it's causal to creative achievement or whether or not these personality traits are incidental to creative achievements. So we need to be mindful that correlation does not equal causation. Now it does appear that these personality traits are consistent across creative individuals. Um, it's just a question of whether or not it is incidental or not. And in some cases, being successful creatives may even change personality characteristics as well. So we need to keep that in mind. So th that's just a little bit of a broad strokes picture of personality and creativity. I also now want to delve into a little more deeply into, as we close out this lecture, into motivation and creativity. What motivates anybody uh, for that matter? You know, we need to kind of be mindful of that as we look at ourselves and we look at highly creative people. What motivates people and what parts of the environment motivate people to do what they do? Well, we can start off with rewards. Rewards will encourage someone to increase a certain behavior or to repeat a certain behavior. Rewards increase a certain behavior and punishment, we know, discourages a certain behavior. Even more strongly than actual reward and punishment is the effect of the promise of reward and punishment. So when an idea of reward or punishment is implanted within our minds. That is actually a stronger motivation than the actual real reward or punishment. So while punishment and reward affect motivation, the threat of punishment or the promise of reward really truly affect motivation and behavior because it is in so it's something that's internalized within the person where motivation lies. So that is why people are motivated in general to do things that they do. And when you are rewarded to, to do something that you do, it increases the probability that you will do the thing again. Obviously, that is called positive reinforcement. So, what motivates someone to do creative acts in the psychoanalytic tradition? Well, the motivation for creativity is a, in many ways, considered a defense mechanism called sublimation from the psychoanalytic tradition at least. And it's basically when you feel psychic anxiety and tension, mental anxiety and tension, you can release that anxiety and tension by doing a productive work, doing a creative work. And so there's kind of like this internal reported need to be creative to solve the problem. So you're being intrinsically rewarded by reducing this internal anxiety within yourself when you perform a creative work. Uh, what you're doing is channelizing that ne negative anxious energy into an outward expression. And so in this view, someone that writes or paints, um, they are simply transforming that anxious energy into a productive act. So in the psychoanalytic tradition, creative pursuits are in a ways an adaptive form of neuroticism. Now, in the humanistic tradition, uh, if we take a look at someone like Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we can see that self-actualization is the highest form of being human. So once our basic needs are met, then we have the need to express ourselves and to engage the world and expressions uh, of that in creativity are part and parcel of that self-actualization process. So creative needs are after your basic survival needs, your safety needs. And when your social needs are met and satisfied, then finally the highest level you come to the level of the creative, of self-actualization, where thriving takes place, according to Abraham Maslow. This is a natural drive that comes when all of the lower drives, needs have been finally satisfied. And what we know is that one way or another, the drive to be creative seems to be associated with intrinsic reward or intrinsic motivation. 
it isn't something that is necessarily external. And so we need to always keep in mind that a true creative person is someone that is intrinsically rewarded. The creative act, therefore, uh, for the creative person is the intrinsic reward. It is the reward in itself. To create isn't for money or fame, necessarily. It is for the actual creative process, the creation. So, for example, extra motivation is achieving. So something like award-winning or prize-making money, these are extrinsic rewards. If you're doing something for fame, that is an extrinsic reward. To be truly creative is to be intrinsically motivated. And that is the reward of attaining the creative solution itself. The work itself is its own reward. Doing the work is intrinsically rewarding and you don't need extra external extrinsic rewards necessarily. Now, you should note that extrinsic rewards can be the initial impetus. So, for example, you're getting paid to do something. Um, perhaps it provides shelter, it provides safety, it provides basic needs, and then moves you up the hierarchy of needs. But ultimately, creative rewards is about self-expression and self-actualization. And the intrinsic reward is what we really, what really keeps the creative person going is they're being rewarded from inside themselves. Now, there's a researcher from Harvard Business School known as Teresa Ambele, and uh, she's done some good work on motivation and creativity, and she came up with the idea that there is intrinsic motivation hypothesis for creativity, where the intrinsically motivated state is uh, inducive to creativity, whereas the external an extrinsically motivated state is actually detrimental to the creative state. And this is kind of borne out by people like Howard Gardner and Michaela Chikset Mahaya. So, for example, uh, Howard Gardner in his book Creative Minds explores multiple intelligences and identifies that many people, uh, many with many different types of intelligences that are creative, are essentially intrinsically motivated. They were motivated by the work itself. And they weren't necessarily working for money or fame, or it's just that they simply enjoyed the work, and that itself was the motivation. And this can kind of tie us into what it means to be happy in work, in many ways. And this is where we come to uh, Mahaley Robert Chiksent Mahaya uh, and his concept of the state of flow, uh, the psychological state of flow. Because the state of flow is where there is a skill challenge balance, where we have, have to use all of our skill and all of our effort. But when we do use all of our skill and all of our effort, we are able to surmount uh, that mountain that is before us. It's not that, th that it is impossible to get over, but it takes a lot of work and effort. But when you use all your work and all your effort and all your skill, and you are able to be successful, it begins to create a psychological state within you that is intrinsically internally rewarding and happiness essentially comes from it and it is such a powerful rewarding state that people will do almost anything to get back to that state uh, and so we see that with highly creative people they experience that flow they are internally motivated to move forward to move forward in time and time itself seems to disappear as well as that sense of self seems to disappear a person tends to get lost in the moment in the project time can seem to slow down in some ways or time 
you can work for 10 hours and you lift, look up and you feel like you've been working for five minutes. Uh, and it seems that in this time dilation, in this loss of self, people disappear and become totally absorbed in the work and in this state of flow. What is sometimes considered to be pure happiness. It's so rewarding that they do almost anything to get back to it. And what is important about this psychological state is that it is completely self-rewarding. And so intrinsic motivation is very clearly important within this creative process. And so the highly motivated, high achieving creatives demonstrate the skill to enter that state of flow, to lose themselves in their work, and to be motivated by their work, and to have that be the reward itself, apart from the extrinsic rewards that they may or may not receive. And so in essence, highly creative people are creative because it makes them happy. And we'll leave you there for this week for our lecture. I hope you enjoyed this week. You take care. Bye-bye.